This is Mark. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm not too bad. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, happy to do it. Um, I'm just going to check that all the levels. You can hear me okay and everything like that? Sure. Perfect. And you're looking at pretty good. I might even just bring it down just a little bit. Um, great. Um, I think that should just be really about it. So um, I've got um, a couple questions, Mark. Like I'll, I'll be pretty straightforward, I suppose. Um, yeah. Like obviously, flat Earth um, is something I've been pretty interested in mm -hmm. uh, just just of recent. Uh, I'm a pretty big conspiracy theorist kind of guy myself, and obviously, flat Earth uh, is pretty. It's taken become pretty popular in the last couple of years, right? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> as you would know. But oh, yeah. I think, for me, it's one I've been I've known about, but as soon as you kind of hear about it, you know, it kind of has, like, I suppose like any conspiracy theory, you kind of hear, you get negative sort of connotations about it and so on and so forth, but I feel like Flat Earth is really one of those ones where people just shut it down straight away, right? Like, it definitely, people just don't want to borrow it. Would that be safe to say? Oh yeah, yeah, me me included. Nobody likes it immediately. Um, most people, even when they're looking into it, even if they want to really absorb it, it takes them two weeks to, to get around the conditioning. And and that's mostly because of the icons. Uh, I, I can't really speak for Australia, but in the United States, for example, when you're six years old, there's two things you will always see in your classroom. One is the American flag up in the corner, and the other is a globe which is sitting usually right below it and yeah. that's powerful conditioning you know even though you're just kind of looking at a toy you know just this illustrated toy you it sits there quietly in the classroom for 12 years to where uh the conditioning you know becomes orwellian at that point you're i mean think of it this way when we get out of high school we're willing to a lot of americans are willing to fight for the american flag and the globe is no different I mean, um, let, let me tell you really quick, and I know you got you probably got a whole bunch of questions, but when I, if you didn't already hear, when I first clicked on my uh, flat, the, the first flat Earth video I ever saw in 2015, I got a vis a visceral response. I actually got flushed. I was embarrassed to click on it, and I was a conspiracy guy, and I'd seen a lot of weird stuff on the internet. Right? There's there's a lot of weird stuff out there. I had never been embarrassed before. And I, and that I caught myself doing it where I was going, why, why is this thing affecting me? It's a stupid conspiracy. In fact, it's one of the worst conspiracies you could think of. And that's how I knew that there was something more to it initially. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's, that's great. I like the, um, I think people are really going to resonate with that, that you even coming into it like, what is this? And this is like the most bizarre thing I've ever heard of. And then oh, yeah. obviously there was a couple, um, couple holes in you know in the stories that you're kind of hearing and you wanted to look more into it so i think that's really great for yeah. just people to get their heads around it's like you're not just um you know because it's so easy to get excited about a conspiracy but as you said like you were kind of you didn't really want to look too much into it and then when you did well it just opened up yeah a lot of a lot of uh, questions i suppose the the average person for example uh and, I, and i've run into it you know we've, we've never had any sort of violent confrontations between flat earthers and not flat earthers but what I try to tell people when they get upset, because again, people that are listening to this are, are, I mean, there's probably people like looking for your email address right away going, oh, I'm <laughs> writing this guy. It's like, do you even know why you're upset? That's the other thing, which is, it's like, do you even know why you're, you know, you're, you're resisting, why you're just pushing against this thing harder than anything else? Um, the story I talked about in the, in the first Flat Earth Clue is where I literally have friends that think the entire royal family of Britain is made up of lizard people. Yeah. And, and Ed, I'll go, I go, yeah, if you looked into flat earth, they don't get the hell out of here. It's like, <laughs> why wouldn't you ever look into flat earth? It's like, and, I'm, and I look at them and go, really? Because you, lizard people, you know, that whole thing. And, and they're like, yeah, flat earth is infinitely more uh, ridiculous than that. And I was going, wow, is it? Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a fascinating journey if, if when, you, when you get into it, because uh, there's all these little twists and turns. And again, what I told people, and I told myself when I was making the clues, I said, if any one of the clues that I'm, I'm starting down points to something else, points in a different direction, 
I'm, I'm walking away from flat earth and it never did to where, again, you know, I, I put the, the call out to the internet in 2015 and I said, really help me out here. T tell me, tell me where I'm wrong. Cause for whatever reason, I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. And that's, and I, I, I've got to preface it with this, uh, which is we're not, I can, I, can I show you right now? Can I prove to you the, the, the world is flat? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. No, I cannot. But like a court case, I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat earth model. And you say, well, no, reasonable doubt isn't enough. I go, really? Because it works in court every single day. I can't, yeah. again, can't speak in, in Australia, but in, in the United States, reasonable doubt every day works. And that's all people need. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, great. Right. No, that's fine. It's, uh, it's good stuff you're giving us, so... It's uh, it's awesome. Um, so just why don't you just give us a little bit of your background, Mark? Like, sure. who are you, and where does this all kind of start for you? Uh, I am a, well. I used to be a, uh, a proprietary software trainer. I, I started out my career in the '90s playing video games for a living in Boulder, Colorado, which is really weird. I mean, I was one of the first people ever to play video games for a living. Uh, yeah, hired wow. by a little publisher that published games and nobody in the company actually played games, which is like, that's, of course, we all know better now. It's like, you've got to hire ringers. And I was very good uh, at, at games and especially pinball for whatever reason. I, I, I like stand up pinball, which I know the pinball industry died in 99. Anyway, after that, uh, I taught proprietary software and traveled around the country and, and other countries um, teaching blue collar factories about time and attendance software. And I got pretty good at boiling down complex subjects and theories into something that the average person on the street could understand. And I did that for the better part of 20 years in, in Colorado. And then I, during that whole time, I got into conspiracies. And I got into conspiracies fairly late. I'm older, but I got into them fairly late where uh, the first conspiracy I even heard of was, was JFK, you know, from the movie back in the early 90s, the Oliver Stone movie. And then I, I and over the next 20 years, you know, as the internet grew, which was kind of a, a great way to get into the internet, you know, when it was like just starting out, when you could actually finish the internet, there wasn't that much out there. Um, I, I had an opinion on just about every conspiracy you could think of, and everybody knows, everybody in the conspiracy world knows, heck, everybody in the world knows about Flat Earth. I have yet to run into a single person that I've said, oh yeah, Flat Earth, and they look at me, you know, like I asked them a math problem, and they said, I had never heard of it. And um, everybody hates it, <laughs> including <laughs> me. It's, it's literally the last thing you would ever look at. Everybody looks at every other conspiracy, you know, like Bigfoot having Elvis's baby, and you know, the Loch Ness Monster Church and stuff like that. I mean, there's all sorts of fun conspiracies out there. I just made up the Loch Ness Monster Church, by the way. And <laughs> you're, you're like, wait, wait, is that the thing? No, it's not. <laughs> um, the, uh, and then I just out of conspiracy boredom, and, and I'll, I'll coin that term, conspiracy boy, boredom, I looked into it in 2014, the, the summer of 2014. It was just a video that was recommended, this random video by a German guy uh, in YouTube. And I looked into it about flight routes and I looked at it and I was going, huh, that's really interesting. I mean, I didn't know German, but I knew the graphics and I'm going, huh. It'd be, he basically was saying the flight routes don't make sense in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. And from, from Southern to Southern, not Southern to Northern. And I looked at it and I'm going, oh, that's, that's really interesting. So then I looked at other things that were kind of tied to it. And the more I looked into it, I, well, then I, I, I decided I'd dedicate myself to like shutting it down. It's like, okay, I will now officially look at this, check it off my bucket list and go back to my life. And it just snowballed to where there I was nine months later. It, it should have only taken me a couple of days to knock this thing out. Nine months later, I'm, I'm just staring at my machine going, okay, something's horribly wrong here. And it was kind of like a slow motion version of, of, you know, the whole Neo journey. Really, really slow. And I decided, that's when I decided to make the Flat Earth Clues, which again was just kind of a cry for help. I, I knew the internet hive mind was very, very intelligent. I mean, much more intelligent than ever, any individual. And so I put it out there and uh, really thought that some academic was going to blow me out of the water within... I don't know, a couple days. That's why that's why I put my phone number and my email address out there. It's like, yeah, call me. <laughs> Tell me, help, <laughs> help me, please. 
And it was the opposite. Uh, not only did I have people wanting to, to talk to me about it interview wise, but you know, the average person was just calling me and then subject matter experts were calling me from, from all different walks of life and you know, military and, and civilian and engineers and anyone that had to do anything with flight. And they all said the same thing. It's like, yeah, you know what? It's not that crazy because we have all heard of the curvature of the earth and the spin of the earth and nobody uses it in their calculations when when they do their their day-to-day -day jobs re regarding this stuff and that's that was four years ago and now you know we're on tour <laughs> we're, there's i've like i've already done three conferences this year and the next one in fact i'm going to be in your neck of the woods um uh, I think you, today's the 12th, I think like in two weeks. I, I'm, oh, wow. I'm shooting like a commercial down there and I'm supposed to talk about it yet. Um, and then I've got a, a conference in Ohio, Stockholm, UK, uh, Mount Shasta, California. There's one in Amsterdam, which I'm not even going to. They, I, I didn't get invited, I don't know why. And then uh, Dallas, Texas. And then I just heard like three days ago that uh, there's going to be one, in, you know, starting off the beginning of next year in Serbia. So I was like, okay, sure. Why, why not? So, yeah, it's it's way we, we made the um, I'll, I'll drop it in Skype for you. We just made the cover of Newsweek. It's like, okay, wow. that, that's a thing now. So, yeah, it's gotten way, way bigger than I thought it would ever be. Uh, uh, the, the scientific journals are now losing it because they, they don't know what to do, you know, because it's becoming a big deal. I mean, I had National Geographic ask me if this was going to usher in the new, the next dark ages. And wow. I, I thought, wow, that might be a little dramatic, but, <laughs> I, you know, it's not like we're going out there. We're not burning down libraries yet. So I, I don't, I don't think that'll happen, but you never know. Anyway, sorry. No, how insane though that something that you found out about all these years ago has now spiraled into, you know, you traveling around the world and, yeah. you know, it's like, who would ever even like think of just coming across something like that and going, wow, like look where it's, it's your life now, isn't it? Well, it is. And it kind of feels like, I, I hate to say this, but it kind of feels like it's being allowed to happen. I, I got I to use a line from Star Wars. If you're if you're ever a Star Wars fan, like the, the first one where Carrie Fisher, uh, Princess Leia, you know, when the, the Falcon escapes from the Death Star, she goes, she goes, that was too easy. They let us go. You know, like they're they're tracking. Yeah. He's oh, not this ship, sister. And and that's when I, I try to tell people when, you know, when they say, oh, YouTube's trying to censor us and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, no, no. YouTube has been helping us, you know, and their parent company, Google, for at least three years helping us we've been recommended so many times for anything yeah. and the fact there was a um now part of it's monetarily because you know youtube's the biggest technically it's the biggest television network in the world you know they have just massive massive lifetimes worth of content out on there now and they there was this programmer that left youtube and they asked him you know in like a con candid conversation and, and said oh well what how, how do things get recommended you know recommended for you you know on the sidebar and he goes, out of all the topics he could have picked, he says, well, if the average person that gets into Flat Earth watches 20 videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend? <laughs> and I'm going, oh, man, that's not good. Because they were. They were recommending us for everything. Um, you know, tra tractor maintenance, five Flat Earth videos recommended for you. But take a <laughs> salad recipes. Here's three Flat Earth videos. It's like, what? There's the, people were complaining a lot to where the, the United States government got involved. You know, we had, there was a, I mean, I'm staring at the television and there's a Senate hearing and they're bringing us up, you know, of course it wasn't just us. It was also nine 11 and snake oil stuff like, you know, yeah. like miracle cures for stuff. I'm going really, cause I didn't think miracle cures had ever really been that. I mean, everybody knows, but, but to bring us up in that sort of company was, was a, believe me it was astounding and i'm like i didn't even know about the cover of newsweek somebody had to send that to me it's like look what i just saw on the newsstand i was going what so yeah Insane. we're it's i but i i do believe that there's some, that we're not being the resistance we've gotten from the powers that be has been token at best i mean even when neil degrasse tyson went on comedy central he, you know, when he did that seven minute rant against us and he was really trying to rant. Well, supposedly he was ranting against rapper B.O.B. because he was rapper B.O.B. was the one that called him out in a song. Uh, he was really going against us, but he didn't bring his A game. 
You know, he didn't use any graphics, no animations, no no formulas. He just talked for seven minutes and, you know, lost the audience almost immediately. Uh, but but sorry, let me let me circle back, which is because you you mentioned you know kind of like how and why and you know this thing's gotten so big. Part of the reason this thing has gotten so big is because it's easy to explain now. Uh, it is the the heliocentric the solar system model is quite complicated compared to the flat Earth model. I mean you need geometry and trigonometry and, and calculus and eventually quantum physics, whereas the flat Earth model uh, it's basically just a snow globe. You know, it's it's a terrarium, it's a planetarium, it's just a big box, a big soundstage, and and you, needs almost no math, and that works because people are really susceptible to easy things. You know, the average person, I, again, can't speak for Australia, in the United States doesn't even remember algebra from high school, right? and mm -hmm. I was I was one of those people. So, like when the curvature of the Earth formula came out, uh, I, I, was, I it took me a while. It's like, oh right, that stuff. It's, you know, I'm flashing back to my younger younger days. And that that so that has worked. You know, people want easy stuff. They they want they want they, they will always. It's uh, the the old saying from Sun Tzu, the art of war. People are like water. They always take the path of least resistance. That is absolutely true. And if the flat Earth model is now easier to to explain than the solar system model, then that's what they're going to go with. And that's why it just keeps resonating and resonating. Uh, let me end with this this part with this which is um, there was a study done. It was concerning scientists enough to where they went to one of their research teams out in the UK called U.gov. And they did a survey to where uh, they were asking, you know, 10,000 Americans what they thought about the shape of the earth, blah, blah, blah. And they noticed as they got younger, as they skewed to the younger uh, demographics, that the numbers kept going up and up and up to where 18 to 24 year olds were skewing like a full like over a third like 33 34 percent not believing in the globe anymore and that spooked a lot of people uh you know especially like national geographic and it made a lot of major news stories and sci in fact it got bad enough to where science was actually turning on themselves that where the sci other scientific groups were going to u.gov saying well you, you did the study wrong obviously because it couldn't mm -hmm. be that number couldn't be right you know, they were in such denial, they were actually attacking their own. And it's like, what are you talking about? U.gov is like one of your benchmarks. It's the, some of the guys you go to. <clears throat> we didn't ask them to do the survey. You did this. And uh, they, yeah, it, it's it's gotten really, really weird. So, yeah. Well, that was going to be my next question was how many, I suppose, Americans roughly uh, right now in 2019, uh, I guess they've converted to that uh, ideal of that the Earth is flat? uh millions i know that i know that much i mean the even even in the con most conservative of estimates let's say the u.gov survey is right and it's a full three to five percent of americans mm. right you know just across the board you know for, let's take not take into account the 18 to 24 year olds which is way way weirder um remember every percentage point in the united states would be about 3.5 million people and that's that's the conservative est estimates. Uh, a Russian survey, which is why they would do it, I have no idea, said the same sort of thing. They were in the three to five percent range, um, and that's quite quite a few for Russia. Um, but what I what I try to tell people is it's tough for us to get numbers because ninety percent of our community is in the closet, meaning they because of how crazy it is. You know, people don't. <laughs> It's easier to come out again. I'm not judging all God's children. It's easy to come out as gay <laughs> Easier to come out as gay than it is to come out as flat earther Remember the, the the gay community for example is 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 half in and half out of the closet full 50% We're 90% in the closet because everyone's just afraid of friends and family and co-workers I uh, and I've got family members myself. I've got cousins that uh that, that that know full well it's like yeah we're not coming out Be mostly mostly it's it's work it's like yeah you can you can kind of blow off your friends and family and be like hey you know i'm i'm the eccentric one and i don't care what you yeah. think but co-workers if it, it affects your job you know not to use the old urban saying but it's all about the rent you know <laughs> don't no one wants to get fired for flatter and uh so they they stay fairly you know low key under the radar and i know this because i get emails and calls from them every single day you know saying the same thing it's like yeah you know i and and i've even had subject matter experts come to me and say uh i yeah i'll give you the info i'm not coming out 
There's no I've, yeah, I've, right. I've, I've, I've talked to celebrities who, you know, not Kyrie Irving and, and not you know, some of these other guys. I've talked to celebrities that, that, that say, oh, yeah, the, the, in fact, one celebrity in particular, total A-lister star in the Walk of Fame, the whole nine yards. He said, yeah, there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry that know, but, you know, Kyrie Irving set kind of a, a, a weird lesson for people, which is, yeah, once you come out, you can't, you know, put that genie back in the bottle and people will remember that, especially sports figures, you know, because because reporters have access to locker rooms basically after every game. And, you know, sports figures are notorious for boring interviews. So, you know, what are you going to do? And, and now he has, like Kyrie, for example, has to ask, answer those questions every single week. It's like, hey, still believe in Flat Earth? Hey, still believe in Flat Earth? So, yeah, right. so, no, you know, celebrities are kind of waiting until it gets a little bigger. But we're close. The, the documentary helped a whole bunch, uh, the Behind the Curve documentary. And uh, television people have been swimming around now for several years and, and they all know the numbers aren't going away and they, they know they can turn this into something. They, they just are nervous like anybody else. It's like, okay, do I do, you know, what happens to, if it becomes a network show? In fact, I predicted the headline in advance where I said, the, if, if somebody does a television show on Flat Earth, the, headline will re the headlines will read, uh, is this genius or is this the end of television as we know it? And it's amazing to me because it's like, look, we can do shows, especially in the United States now, we, we have shows about freaking everything, target demographics, you know, b you know, guys with beards who cook and hunt alligators. Yeah, I'm just going to mix them, right? It's like, it, there isn't, nothing is off limits when it comes to shows, except for this. And it's, yeah, right. you know, it's got to tell you something. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, full on. Very like, great answers, by the way. So okay. good stuff. Um, all right, so I'm sure everyone's just dying to know, yes. what are your reasons for believing that the Earth is flat? What have you discovered? And oh, yeah, the... yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give, you, that. I'll give you different reasons from the clues because the clues, you know, weren't exactly scientific. They were really connect the dots more than anything. I'll give you the same stuff I've been giving people since the – there was a German television team that, that approached me that said, yeah, you know, because I've, I've always wanted to, to debate ab academics. But the problem with academics is that they're very limited in their, you know, they're very, very narrow focused. You know, they focus on one little aspect. And they, if it's outside of that aspect, they, they just don't want to deal with it. But I'll, I'll tell you the story anyway. So ZF1 uh, contacted me and said, yeah, we've got a, an astrophysicist out of Georgetown University in the United States that uh, is willing to debate you but we don't want it to be like a hot debate we don't want you talking over each other and so what we're going to do is we're going to record you asking some questions we'll take those those questions and we'll give them to the video to the physicist and then we'll just he'll we'll record his responses and we'll just basically be the go-between and but you guys were, are never going to talk live even though i knew the guy's name and it's like okay sure why not and they go okay come up with five scientific points for flat earth and here are my five quick points that I that I give people. Um, <clears throat> the first one it would be the uh, long distance photography, which is uh, you know if the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared. And I didn't come up with this one. These, these are all points that people brought up to me. It had nothing to do with the clues. Uh, but long distance photography. If the if the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared, which is eight inches per mile per mile, and that's not hard. I know people are going. I don't remember algebra. No, no, it's easy. So all you do is you take um, whatever distance it is and multiply it by itself. So it's five miles. It's five times five, which is 25, and then times that times eight inches, and you get a number. And it gets steeper and steeper. So it's not stairs because everyone thinks, oh, it's eight inches per mile. It's, no, that's a slope. If you need a, to do a curvature, it's got to be squared. So like say at 100 miles, for example, it's 100 times 100 uh, which is 10,000 times, it gets really, really steep. So like at 50 miles, for example, it's about 1,700 feet of curvature. So you look off into the distance and you shouldn't, remember, because it should be behind the curve, it should be on the other side of the hill, you shouldn't see objects uh, lower than 1,700 feet. Now I know there's going to be people say, well, no, it's refraction and lights being bent and all this stuff. It's like, well... Yes and no. I mean, yes, we are looking through uh, like a, a, a thin version of water right now. Most people don't remember that like the stuff that we're breathing in right now is mostly nitrogen. 
<clears throat> it's mostly um it's only it's less than 20 percent oxygen and it's about 80 percent nitrogen and i know there's trace gases but let's keep it simple um but i've seen time lapse footage from 50 miles where there is no mirage nothing wavers like the chicago skyline over lake michigan where um you know the weather comes in it gets light and dark uh and you know the um just about any type of light conditions that you can think of that, that are happening during the day and it, and it never ever happens the if it's a mirage then it's the most amazing mirage ever because it persists and i'm not talking just about chicago talking about any of them they persist through any light conditions any weather conditions just about any distance and any location and and it can be targeted with weapon systems and destroyed that's that's the big one i had military guys saying oh yeah we're we're using two degree beam radar to hit things at 50 nautical miles and we should the thing is we shouldn't even be able to see it at 50 nautical miles so why are we painting the target for the sparrow missile system and the nobody can explain it that's that's the first one long distance photography uh the, okay. the short version is this the boat that goes over the horizon 10 years ago i would have been absolutely with you uh, you know that's the argument against flat earth boats going over the horizon mm -hmm. we all know it they go hole first and they're gone they're gone they're never to be never to return it's like well now hd cameras have changed that uh, the Nikon P1000, a perfect example, or the P900, which used to be the old version, um, you can now zoom in and bring those boats back into frame. And you can keep bringing it back. And you say, well, what's the point? My point is, well, that boat is gone. It should be gone over the horizon, and yet you can br keep bringing this boat back. It's, it's there. It's absolutely there. Uh, second one would be gravity versus the vacuum of space. That's a fun one where uh, gravity so uh, science will say that the only reason our atmosphere is clung to this ball is because of gravity and if it wasn't for that we'd be dead because the the atmosphere would just be peeled off and it's like well I, i've talked to industrial vacuum experts that say it should be peeled off anyway because vacuum will always win against gravity i'll give you a, a short demonstration let's say uh you're sitting where you are now and there's a second floor to your building and you make that second floor into a vacuum chamber and you put a cork in the ceiling and you pop it. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Every scientist, in the, every scientist in the world is going to say the same thing. It's like, well, it's going to equalize instantly. It's going to be violent and you're going to pass out and maybe even die. Depending on how big the vacuum chamber is upstairs. Well, my argument is why didn't gravity keep all the air in your room down below? And, and they don't have an answer for this. It's like, uh, well, because it's just equals. I go, well, what's the difference between the gravity on the ground right now in your room and, you know, the vacuum chamber in above you immediately or a vacuum chamber in space? In fact, the, the big question I pose to science is, where is the bleeding edge of space? Where is our atmosphere? Where does our atmosphere end and space begin? And tell me how that works, because it absolutely defies one of the laws of thermodynamics which says pressure needs a container, period. Uh, contents under pressure, we all know this, can of hairspray, can of paint, contents under pressure. If you, if you pump up a basketball or a football or soccer ball or whatever you guys call it down there, rugby ball, uh, it, goes, it goes rigid. You know, that's what pressure does and nobody can explain it. Um, third one is, they're a little quicker now, uh, third one is the eclipse of the, um, the, the moon shadow during a solar eclipse. So if the moon is 2,000 miles wide, uh, what well, passes you know, in front of the sun, right, before the Earth, why is the eclipse shadow only 70 miles wide? Why is the blackout zone only 70 miles wide? That's a 97% decrease. That's, that should be impossible. It's like you walking next to a, a wall and your shadow shrinks down to the size of an action figure. Uh, how, how does that happen? We don't see that in, in real life. In science, you'll say, well, science says that, it, you know, you'll see the diagrams where it, it con converges the, the shadow down to this point. I'll go, okay, fine. You want to do that, then the, should, the same should apply. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Should apply to the moon uh, when the earth is in front of it. So if the earth is four times as wide, it's 8,000 miles wide, supposedly, then the blackout zone should be 240, 250 miles wide. So, or I'm sorry, 280 miles wide. Whew screwed that up uh, 280 miles wide we should see a blackout zone across the moon that's about 280 miles wide about the 10th size of the moon it would be very easily visible even without uh, binoculars we never ever see that we either see the phases of the moon or we see a blood moon it's the exact opposite how does that work what how is you know you're talking about two completely different situations i mean as far as two different completely results but the same physics involved doesn't ever happen uh fourth one would be the moon temperature which I didn't even believe. I was in a flat earth a year and somebody told me this and I said, get out of here. Kind of like the lizard people thing. 
I go, they said, somebody called me up during a show and said, yeah, by the way, the moon um, generates a cold light. It's like a cold laser. And I go, what? I go, how's that work? And they, and they explain it to me. So I'm not going to convert it to um, uh, Celsius for you guys. Which is, if the um, if the sun, y'all know that it's it's cooler in the shade, right? You don't know that. So if it's ninety degrees in the sun, it's eighty degrees in the shade, or give or take. And that's because the the object is blocking some of the sun's rays. Well, if it's in the moonlight, it's the exact opposite. So if it's fifty degrees in the moon light, it's sixty degrees in the moon shade. In fact, up to thirteen degrees swing, it's warmer in the moon shade, quite a bit warmer. And that shouldn't be. Remember, the sun is lit. I'm sorry, the moon is lit because the sun is reflecting off of it. Some of its radiation is bouncing off of it. At the very least, it should be neutral. It should never go negative. And it's like science is absolutely denying this. And you can go test this yourself. Go down to the hardware store, buy one of those point-and-click infrared thermometers they use for engines and roads. And you can go test this yourself. That's, that's a cheap way of doing it. I've had people test it with copper strips and water with digital thermometers. In fact, they've done uh, three groups. It's not, and it's really fascinating. You you test the moonlight, you know, the, the temperature of the water and moonlight, the temperature and moon shade, and then I I was the one that came up with this. I go, what happens if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight? Does it get warmer or does it get even colder? It gets colder. It gets even colder than no, normal moonlight. And I didn't even know this was a thing. We can you think, wow, this is really far fetched. It's like no, we can duplicate this in a lab right now. It's called a cold laser. Um, we've been able to do this for some years now where you, you just tune the frequency of a laser. Now, it's not like a, a Batman, Dr. Freeze, um, Dr. Freeze, Mr. Freeze, Mr. Freeze, beam where, you know, he points stuff and you can, you know, turn things into icicles. But you can actually make things slightly colder with a cold laser. So why is the moon generating a cold laser light? It's self-illuminated. Does that prove a flat Earth? Nope, but it absolutely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Last but not least would be my fifth point with these uh, the Van Allen radiation belts which is it's a trap mm -hmm. question and it cannot be beaten no one has ever even come close to beating it to this day I mean people flail about and they they basically just change the the, the the conditions of the questions like obviously say well you're doing it wrong it's like no 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 here it is are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly yes or no for those of your listeners that don't remember what those are they are they were discovered by NASA <laughs> go figure in 1959, a year after NASA was founded by a guy named Van Allen, who uh, said that, yeah, there's, there's bands of radiation up there that are super, super, super deadly. No one should ever go up there. And yet, almost immediately afterwards, Kennedy says, oh, yeah, we're going to go to the moon. It's like, what? Okay. So they had to go back to Van Allen. He goes, oh, we're going to just go real fast. They're not as deadly as I initially had published. Whatever. So they're really, really deadly. So are they deadly? Yes or no? Uh, if you say yes, then how did the Americans with the Apollo program do round trips, a whole bunch of them, through the belts to the moon and back? Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody got cancer. There's still five of them walking around today. There used to be six when I started this. They all, they've all died of natural causes, and they used no shielding whatsoever. They used aluminum and plastic. Aluminum and plastic cannot stop radiation. Only three things we know of can stop it. Lead, gold, and a whole bunch of water. Which is why I use them for like power plants. If you say no, they're not deadly, then I point you directly at the NASA website, and they've got a video out there, and of course it's been replicated on the on the internet many many times, uh, called Orion Trial by Fire, which is about their Mars program, which they keep kicking the can down the road. At the end of 2014, they made a video that specifically covered this, and they said, "Oh yeah, we're not going to test the capsules with people because we haven't solved the radiation problem yet of the Van Allen belts." And they've talked about how deadly they were. And, and of course, it's got to make you scratch your head because, like, what do you mean you haven't solved the problem yet? You, you solved it perfectly back in 1969. In fact, you, you never had a problem ever. No one ever had an issue. In fact, it's amazing. The, the capsules went straight through the belts in, you know, multiple ways. They, they should have been just <clears throat> glowing by the time they were done. And yet they're sitting in the Smithsonian and a Geiger counter, you can put it up to it right now and it reads nothing. Like, it, like mm. it never happened. So how does that work? Anyway, so after those five questions. Sorry, phone. Stop. All right. So uh, after those five questions, uh, the, uh, you know, I sent him off to the Georgetown guy through the F1, and that was it. He, he folded. He said, nope. Wow. We're not, we're not doing this. That's it. And that was the last we ever heard of him. 
And ZF1 canceled the segment, and, and that was it. That's as far as we got. Now, to be fair, I don't blame him because some of those questions were just outside of his area of expertise. Um, he, would he be able to, like, for example, the first question was a photography question. I don't think he, and, and deals with ground level light and physics going, I don't think he'd be able to touch that. The second one, yeah, gravity versus the atmosphere of space. Yeah, he absolutely could have addressed that one. The third one about the eclipse shadow, maybe. The fourth, what about moon temperature? He wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole because he doesn't even know it exists. Nobody did. And the Van Allen radiation belts. Yeah, I, I think he could have probably referenced a friend. He's probably got friends that deal with radiation. He probably could have dealt with it, but he didn't. So there you go. Those five things. Again, do any of those absolutely prove that, that the Earth is flat? No, it does, it does not. But uh, it raises a whole bunch of questions. And they all point towards the same thing. So, sorry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. They, they all, you know, especially when you put them all together like that, it does actually start to build quite a case yeah. to... And it, look into this more, right? Yeah, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a case. It shouldn't be a thing. This this should not be. You know, people. It. This was something where you know the, one of the obvious things that people will come back, especially in the conspiracy world, they'll say, "Well, it's too big, and you'd need too many people to to cover this up. It would it would involve millions and millions of people." And it's like, no, no, no. It's the opposite. It's actually very, very few people, few, few people that know because there's very few people who would actually be able to, to detect it. Um, the, the, one of my little catch paragraphs is that we're talking, basically I'm saying that, that you, you're living in a box, you're living in a giant building, one with walls and a floor and a ceiling that's so big that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until 1960. And when they did, they decided, okay, let's just keep this thing as quiet as possible. And, and you were in 99% of the people that work for any space program don't know anything. They turn wrenches, they, they polish capsules, they build fuel systems. They don't have to know anything. It's only the telemetry guys, the guys that do the data. They're the ones that, that have to, uh, the, they have to fake the stuff. And even then, I, you can compartmentalize it and say, yeah, the, they, don't, they don't have to know why they're faking it. They just know that they're faking it. It's sort of like the astronauts nowadays. The astronauts, yeah. are just, they're just Air Force. They're just military guys. They're, they're Air Force officers. And not and not low ranking officers, you know. Most of them, when they when they leave the program, they're full bird colonels. So you know they follow orders. Uh, if I ever get an, an, another astronaut, I get to talk to. I think one of the questions I'm going to ask him is, have, "Have you ever disobeyed a direct order?" I, I guarantee he hasn't, because otherwise he wouldn't be a colonel. So you know they're they're told to you know basically it's kind of like a spy that's sent out to to assassinate somebody. Right. They're just told yeah. he's going to be at this location at this day. And this is where you'll shoot from. <laughs> and you need to take care of this. They don't go. They don't tell the spy all the political intrigue around it. It's like, OK, here's what he did. And, you know, this long backstory that, in fact, the assassin doesn't care. You know, they're just told it's like, OK, that's that's compartmentalization. Uh, the astronauts nowadays, they're told it's like, OK, you're going to fake this for national security. And unfortunately, you're not high enough rank to even ask why. We're not going to give you a, a briefing on it. And I get it. That's what that's the difference between the astronauts we have now and the Apollo astronauts. The Apollo astronauts, I think, I think knew. And that's why they became recluses and started drinking. Yeah. And uh, all the astronauts now, the, it's just a not, it's just a job to them. They just go out and fake it. And, and I'm sure they know they've heard whispers of why. But, eh, you know, they're 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 just paid to keep their mouth shut and. They go on book tour. It's and it's pr quite lucrative for them. If you're a, 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 a enthusiastic and articulate enough astronaut, after you're done, you can do some book tours and do some public speaking things, and you know have some high schools named after you. So, anyway, yeah, um, definitely. Just going back to those five points, um, yeah. the one that obviously stands out for me is definitely the uh, Ben Allen belt because that's always obviously I've done an episode on. Um, the moon landing being faked and things along those sort of lines. So I'm quite yeah. interested in that sort of um, concept. And as you just said there, like if it, if, if it is dangerous, then there's a bunch of questions there. And if it isn't, then it just raises a whole other sort of bunch of questions. I've never looked at it uh, from both of those sides, I suppose. And seeing that there's it, like their argument doesn't stack up either way. It's kind of like, wow, okay, that's, that really does make you start to think. Oh then, yeah. Well, what, and, what is it, right? Yeah, and the moon landing, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, 
that was one of the things that, you know because again i've looked it up just about every conspiracy and the moon landing never resonated with me for a while as far as um why they would fake it because and again i'm always stunned outside of our country outside of the united states why people believe the americans <laughs> it's like, why it's like we lie about everything constantly we're cut you know we because we want to be the good guys we yeah. we want to portray it's like oh yeah we're the we're the hero in this story <laughs> you know we're the white hats and when it came to the moon landing i never understood why it was like it, yeah I, I got it. it's like okay well they did it for american pride you know it's like elevate us artificially above other countries which is you know wave the flag rah rah go team america is the greatest right well that's a good answer i guess but it's not a great answer especially since we never stayed on the moon that was the thing that threw me more than anything. It's like, okay, so we went molten. We, we went, what, six times in three years, which is an amazing timetable. We just went back and back and like, like we were, it was a commuter week. Oh, we're just going to go to the moon and back. And at the end they said, well, nobody cares. So it's like the American public doesn't care. Like, like they care what the American public thinks in 1972. It's like, nope. It's like the ratings, the television ratings, nobody was watching the moon missions. And it's because they were boring anyway. They were terrible, grainy productions. And after 1972, they said, well, that's it. Apollo 17 and, uh, you know, uh, we're, that's the, you know, they treat it like a television series. It's like, well, rate, yeah. ratings are down. So that's it. This is the last episode. Good night, everybody. And roll credits. And they never, nobody ever went back that since. And that was the other thing. No other country since 1972 has ever gone. The, the Russians, remember, that was a space race. That was a thing. And they, yeah. they just glossed over that. It's like the second the Americans got there, the Russians quit. The Soviet Union quit. <laughs> it's like I've never seen that in the history of sports. It's what are you talking about? They quit. Everyone knows how this would have gone. The Russians would yeah. have put five people. We would have put ten. They put a small base. We put a bigger base. And then Time Magazine runs a story that says, "Has the Cold War reached the moon?" That's how it would have gone. And it's the exact opposite happened, where the Americans went, and then the Russians just said, "Well, that's it then." <laughs> we're we're, we're <laughs> just. It's like, what? And, and then no other country went? I mean, uh, at least manned. Of course, you know, they've said there, there's probes being sent. Supposedly China has a rover on there right now, and yet it can't beam back anything. So, uh, sorry. So there's two parts to that. So that's the first thing, which is like, okay, that part didn't yeah. make sense. But the Apollo footage has aged so terrible. In fact, I will send you real quick, and I don't know if you can see it in Skype, but I'll drop it in, in your box right now. Which is a shot that I just, uh, just a random shot I found of Apollo 12. And it's a, uh, it's an image. This is just a random Apollo 12 image. You know, there's, there's tons of them. This one's wonderful. You know, it's a beautiful shot. Yeah. And uh, it, it basically shows the capsule and the two astronauts on the moon. A lot of people don't know. There's only two ever on the moon. There's three that go, but there's one that, that lives up in an orbiting thing above the moon, which, you know, the capsule docks with and they head back to Earth. Oh, a bunch of crap. So I look at this photo, for example, and I, I throw this out during public speaking things. I go, tell me how many things you can see wrong with this photo. And I go, because there's at least six <laughs> things wrong. It's a beautiful shot, but the longer you stare at it, the worse it gets. Um, it does, doesn't it? Uh, I'm just looking at it now, and some, I'll put this up on the, um, on the Paranormal Thoughts blog for everyone, but just by looking at it... Um, Yes, things start to stand out, don't they? Which oh, don't make it's, sense. Well, first off, it's a beautiful shot. It, it's an amazing shot considering the the person taking the camera with apparently a radiation proof camera. Uh, the, he does he has no viewfinder. He doesn't even know what he's looking at, and it's he's looking at yeah. And it's framed perfectly. Um, the most obvious. I'll take this out of the way. You know, just because it's the it's the most common. That is, there's no stars in the image, and there's no stars in any image ever taken. Uh, away from the Earth, away from Earth orbit. You never, ever, ever see stars. And they said, well, it's an exposure setting. It's like, okay, so change the freaking exposure setting. You didn't have one camera that could do exposure setting differently. The, the, it should be the most beautiful starry sky ever. Because remember, there's, there's no atmosphere on the moon. And the reason why they didn't do, they didn't put stars in for obvious reasons was that the nerds back in the day, and it really hasn't changed, because everything's time, time date stamped. So like this image, you can read below it, it's time date stamped. 
And that means the stars are going to be in a particular place. And it, it exactly, you know, people, physics guys could be able to work out exactly like the belt of Orion should be, you know, let's like, say in the upper right hand corner. Well, if one nerd says, no, it should be, you know, it, if it's in the upper left instead, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. It's the stars, yeah. the, the clock system of the stars make it a literal nightmare to try to, to line everything up. So they said, you know what, just, we're just going to black it out. There's going to be no stars ever. Okay, I get that. That was logistically a sound move, and because the, and other than that, it would have been it turned into a nightmare all the way. Uh, second thing, of course, you probably see the the shadows are all intersecting. Yeah. It's severely intersecting. We've got shadows from the lem, the dish, the photographer, and the flag, all pointing in different directions. That is impossible to do with a single light source, mm -hmm. unless the single light source is only. 50 yards away and you know basically a studio light that's that's how that happens shadows always run parallel with one light source they, they, they always go in one direction we've known this since we were kids you can test this on earth all day long does not it's not different on the moon a vacuum chamber doesn't change the direction of these things the, the shadows should never ever intersect uh the blast crater that that doesn't exist the, you know the lem you know you've got the, la the lunar module there with a, a massive nozzle beneath it, which kicks up a huge amount of thrust. That's how it lands. There should be an amazing splay pattern of this thing when it landed. That doesn't exist. It's like this lem was just set down. The, you remember, we were walking on ash, and they put the ash in there deliberately to do the whole footprint thing, because that's easy way to do the soundstage. You can't do a soundstage with solid rock. It's, it's really, really, really difficult to do. You would have to build, the only way you could do that is if you built a soundstage on rock, which you're not going to do. This was shot somewhere else and they brought in the ash, which of course is a whole nother question, which is how deep exactly is the ash? You never saw these guys with a shovel digging in, you know, like for example, where they, they planted that flag. What did they plant it into? Is it mm. dirt below the ash? Wait, is it rock below the ash? In fact, when you're landing the lem, when the lem splay pattern, well, you know, uh, wouldn't you have kicked the ash out in different directions? Eventually, you're going to see where. Oh, you know, sorry. Let me. I'll, I'll end with the with the ash stuff. The lem, of course. If you zoom in, this is a beautiful high res picture. If you zoom in on the lem, <clears throat> it looks like it was made by a homeless person. It's made out of freaking cardboard and curtain wires <laughs> and tin foil. I mean, you're telling me this thing went through 250,000 miles and is, you know, entered, you know, no, 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 no. Um, two, two other things real quick. That satellite dish, which is supposedly pointing back at Texas, United States. Um, what exactly is powering that? Because if it's battery technology, which it is, you know, they're not using a, a generator. Uh, even when matter if it was, I mean, the average, if you, you know a little bit about radio stations, <laughs> a radio station on a good day, even if it has 50,000 watts of power is going to maybe do, you know, a, a small, you know, barely go outside of the city. It's not going to go very far, right? Yeah. This thing with battery technology, and this is 1969, right? This little VHF transmitter on a, on its best day, maybe has a range of 50 miles, maybe. And, and, and even then, 50 miles, uh, it's barely going to be able to transmit Morse code. And yet, this little dish right here is pumping out 10 frames of video per second with audio and doing send and receive audio transmissions, live transmissions, and its point was pinpoint accuracy at 250,000 miles through the Van Allen belts with no interference whatsoever. It, it's... It's a physical engineering impossibility. It's it's beyond ludicrous. And we just put it out there. Um, last but not least is the spacesuit, which I love so much, which again is the thermodynamics thing. It goes into the whole gravity versus the vacuum of space, which is how are those spacesuits flexible in the slightest? Means pressure needs a container, right? So those spacesuits should just turn into a giant balloon instantly it, i mean the, it would turn into the the astronauts should be like a parade float they they would not be able to boom with their arms or legs there would be no articulation points it would basically it's kind of like the argument i say it's like why isn't a a, a spacesuit a basketball a basketball you know it's got several layers in it you pump it up it is absolutely rigid you cannot fold it you not cannot bend it it is a basketball a spacesuit is the exact opposite for whatever reason it completely defies that and people say well it's layers it's, it's layers. No, 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 no. My winter coat has layers. 
All it does is stop the cold. How is in the world are these guys bending their knees, playing golf, and their hands should be absolutely worthless. They might as well be trying to fumble around with oven mitts. This this picture just sums it up all. I mean, as far as the Apollo program, this is why it has aged so terribly well. They hired an advertising firm to shoot these shots. And the advertising firm, most people don't know anything about physics. They All they want is like they want to create iconic, beautiful shots. And as right. we all know, in the marketing world, you know, it's all about illusion, right? It's, it's all actors and the perspectives are wrong, and, and but we don't care, right? It's like, it's like, well, you know, suspension of disbelief. Well, when it comes to the Apollo program, it's it's absolutely fabricated from, from second one. And the average person on the street doesn't know because they don't know. I, I shouldn't say they don't know science. They really just don't know physics. So anyway, there you go. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Just, I really want to talk about how, so obviously, as you said, everyone understands about flat Earth, right? right. The Earth is not uh, a sphere, per se, right? But it's still round, correct? Like, it's almost just like a, a dinner plate. Yeah, 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 yeah. So side. people, in fact, that's how we usually tell if a person's into flat Earth or not, because they'll use the word round. Mm -hmm. um, and what we mean is we can, yeah, we can use the word round. But a globe mm -hmm. can't use the word round because a globe is three-dimensional and round yeah. can be used for two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So we say globe or sphere or ball. Um, what we're talking about here is, yes, the, the, the flat earth is basically um, a dinner plate which is covered with some sort of barrier. Uh, now, where that whole thing sits, I think, is probably inside a box because, and you know, engineering and computers and, and systems, they don't like circles. Uh, like, computer doesn't even know what a, a circle is. It, it basically draws little squares. Computer has no concept of a circle. Um, but, yeah, it's it's a dinner plate. It's Again, the, the versions I've thrown out there to people, uh, the, the one that resonates with a lot of people is snow globe because they've all seen what they look like. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of like yeah. a snow globe. Only the, the the dome part of it doesn't have to be that high of an arc. It can be very, very low because most of our civilization lives at very, very low altitudes. 90% of the population lives between sea level and one mile up and or one kilometer up, however, which way you want to look. Um, commercial airlines cap out at about 10 miles and spy planes about 20 miles. So it's very, very low by comparison to its width. In fact, it, out from the outside, it would kind of look like a like a shallow sports stadium where, you know, a sports stadium, you don't, you don't have to make it that high. And I know you've compared it to something like the Truman show, right? And I'm sure a lot of people have seen that film. They yeah. can kind of yeah. get that whole idea. And do you think that's kind of in a basic sort of form, that's kind of what we're living it almost like in a simulated kind of. Oh yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 I, I do. The 1998, 1998 movie, the Truman show, which is such a wonderful one of Jim Carrey's best, I think. Um, but the concept is really what drew it. Um, which was that we built the Americans built like a 20 mile wide soundstage and raised a child inside it, which of course they wouldn't do just one child. They do multiple children. Um, and then he, but he didn't know because why would he, um, the, the great line from there is that we believe the world is that is presented to us and the inside of the technology, which was kind of a hybrid of, of modern and older technology. Uh, you know, you could simulate the stars and the sun and the moon and, uh, and it was quite convincing and we can actually, you know, for the, as far as the nighttime stuff, our planetariums can do that very, very easily. Now that's the mechanical side of things. Uh, and, and I might as well get into it a little bit because I'm sure you've touched on it before, which is it, the Truman show was mechanical in nature. It was a physical structure. Whereas like the matrix was digital in nature. It mm -hmm. was, it was a virtual reality. It was a simulation. And I hate to say it, and, and I, I, but I, I, but it's something I believe in, which is, um, look, if it's, if it's, if it's uh, a flat enclosed structure, it really leans towards virtual. It leans towards a simulation, um, mostly because of what we've been building ourselves over the last 15, 20 years. Our simulations have gotten way more complex. We haven't been able to tie, to, you know, to tap into the human brain yet, nor I think there's probably going to be some ethical issues if we ever go down that road. But there are experiments that anyone thinks I'm kidding here, I think it's far-fetched. And, and I don't go into it that much because people don't understand it. Unless you've done software development at all, you fully are, are you're not going to get a lot of the simulation stuff. I mean, the Matrix is 20 years old now. 
And, you know, it's not like we've, we've seen this big revolution in terms of people that believe in simulations. It's like, oh, it's a good movie. It's like, yeah, but you're not getting it. You're not getting Kind of like when, um, when Tron first came out, the, the one, the Tron from the 80s. You know, 99% of the population didn't even own computers. And Tron didn't make much of an impact because people didn't get it. Um, the, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is the simulation theory, for example, if the, there's something called the double slit experiment, and anyone can look this up, which basically says that when you're not looking at something, whatever's behind you is not being rendered graphically uh, to the nth degree. It's not, it's not using max graphics. And you're saying, okay, what's that got to do with thing? I'm going, well, that's what we do in computer simulations. And we kind of did that on accident. Basically, if anyone's ever played games, and I'm sure you have too, is if the, I say it about characters. So if you're, the character in your game is never going to go to the other side of that mountain in the distance, do you draw that mountain? Do you draw the other side of that mountain if you're a programmer? No, you don't. It's conservation of resources. Why would you draw that? It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of, of computer power. Well, that's what we see here in our real world. And you're thinking, wow, it sounds like a movie plot. It's like, yeah, it was the 13th floor, <laughs> which was done in, in uh, 1999 uh, as well, which was based on a German movie called uh, World on a Wire from the 1970s. Why the Germans would make a computer simulation movie in the 1970s, I don't know, I have any idea. And that was based on a book from at least a decade earlier called Simulcron 3, which was you know, kind of the, pre the, the predecessor to the word simulation that we use. And... It's it happens. I mean, it's it's out there, but I can't say that. I mean, people don't understand simulations, so I don't I don't I don't use it. You had to start somewhere, and the easiest thing to bring up is flat. But if it is flat and an enclosed, then you are there. There's a high probability that you're living in some sort of simulation. So there you go. that makes sense. Yeah. I think um, the idea of it being a simulation that resonates more with me, I suppose, rather than a physical structure right that's well sure actually... i mean but but people want remember people want the easy stuff so they'll say mm -hmm. well how does the sun and the moon work and they want me to define things physically mechanically yeah. so when i told people <laughs> and i know people gave me grief for it it's like well, you're saying that you know there's an artificial system that's pumping lava mechanically underneath the ground i'm going yeah yeah that's why why would you why would you make anything organic and it's, and the only reason people fought back on that one is because we've never really made movies that have covered that and we've never filled in the gaps with science fiction so they don't have any reference point and they say oh that's stupid that's ridiculous and it's going oh so you're only saying that because you've never thought of it but you never in a if it was an artificial world nothing would be organic you're not going to leave anything to chance so when people were worried about like super volcanoes i was going well super volcano is a nice idea you know, it's very scary and dramatic, but you never allow that to happen in an environment like this. It's if it's completely controlled, you're not going to let it get wiped out, you know, just in a blink of an eye. There's nothing random here. Yeah. So, so why for, you know, what was it? Was it about 2000 years or whatever? Um, mm -hmm. We've had this construct that the the world isn't flat, right? Right. It did. Was it? Was it sort of, I don't know, did it sort of happen in the sense that they believed it actually was, it wasn't flat anymore? Oh, I think, or, I, or think they... it, I think it was introduced artificially. Okay. Uh, and and okay, I, I, I kind of touched out on that in the clues, which is, yeah, why, what happened? You know, why, why mm. did all of a sudden we go from flat to non-flat? Why did yeah. every culture draw the same thing for a while, for a long time, most of our, most of our history, and then all of a sudden science introduces the globe i mean yeah i know there's people who say well you know eratosthenes and those guys back the greeks yeah. back in the day it's like yeah but i don't really count them because they were leaning towards the sphere but they had no map for it so remember no one was even really exploring back then so you're, you're fine you want to introduce a sphere with no map to go with it and eh, the credibility is just not really there it really wasn't until 500 years ago when the copernican model and the mercator map they actually came out about the same time which is interesting because the mercator map is what we use in classrooms today which is also fascinating if you guys want to look it up um mercator versus and, and even, even mainstream science will agree it's like no yeah the mercator map is absolutely wrong um, it should look like the Gall-Peters map. The continents are not what the sizes they should be. 
you know, and you can tell the Mercator map because Greenland, this massive continent, it's about the same size of Af as size of Africa, uh, exists on the map, and it's like it shouldn't be that big, and it's it's tiny by comparison. Greenland's super small; it's like seventeen times smaller than Africa, but the map still shows it. And it's like, okay, so why don't we introduce uh, the correct map into the system? And that's because, well, it, for whatever reason, they they don't they think it's a jar to the system. And so they don't want to do it. So the map that gets pulled down in front of the class is still the Mercator map. It's 500 years old and wrong. Yeah, right. And people keep saying it. Um, but it, I think it was introduced artificially by the builders or builder, depending on what your preference is, uh, because human beings are really, really curious about stuff. And if you tell people there's an end to the world, an edge to the world, by the way, the title of my new book, and End of the World, Flat Earth Clues, End of the World. And you tell people it's out there, they're going to go for it eventually. Um, and for the longest time, and you got to put it out there way in advance and tell them there is no edge. It's a globe, so there's no edge. So you can go mm -hmm. round and round and round and round, and you're never going to find the edge. You're stuck here. You're stuck on this ball. And by that, I mean, let's say you're the king of France in I don't know, 1600, right? You have wooden ships and you have horses. What are you going to do with that? And, and somebody tells you what, that there is an end to the world. Somebody shows you a flat earth map. What are you going to do with that? You, there's nothing. You can't do anything with it. It wasn't until 100 years ago that we even had the tech to even get to even start really exploring things. And that was the internal combustion engine when we started building planes. So, and by that, I mean, really wasn't, in fact, we, you know, we haven't even had jets that long. We, and uh, pressurized aircraft, we haven't even had that long by comparison to, to the rest of mm. civilization. And that's why when they started exploring the governments knew they still had the old maps but they couldn't exp they couldn't do anything until almost 1960 and that's when they just started sending their guys well actually they started sending their guys about 1930 it took them 30 years to figure it out they they sent admiral Byrd to the north pole in 1928 and they found something whatever it is i don't know a big opening big tower frost giants who knows where they found they they said okay well we're gonna go out to antarctica and he spent you know the pretty much the rest of his life flying military aircraft in antarctica looking for what i consider to be the end you know the ed the big edge of the world and when they found it that's when everything changed it's like okay now that we know now we can you know start to dictate policy and and again we they you know you don't tell the public it might have been one of your questions like why why don't you tell the public it's like are you kidding yeah the public what's that line from men in black it's like a person is smart but people are dumb panicky and dangerous and you know it it's like you, yeah exactly you tell people that all of a sudden they're you know that you're not that, that well, well we won't go into religious aspects of it too much but i mean you tell them well, first off that god is real and it's like fine it may not be a you know santa claus in a bathrobe sitting on a cloud type god because you know there's five five major religious houses out there but that that alone would spook people terribly. Plus, yeah. you know the economic side of things, which is uh, our economics are really really twitchy, and you'd have to you'd have to suspend world trading for months to figure out what was going on there. And then of course academia, which is uh, you know as, as, astronomy and astrophysics would shut down tomorrow. And then the rest of the physical sciences, you know biology, hydrology, archaeology. Uh, just take your pick. Anything with analogy next to it, those would have to be completely retooled. Academia, think of every university in every country. Those would have to be, you know, not just universities, high schools as well. Every, everything would have to be redone. Um, that's a lot of chaos, and they're not going to do it. They're just not, they're yeah. not, not until they can figure out a way, and maybe they have. Maybe that's why it's coming out now. Maybe that's why we're talking about it, is that they've come, they've figured out a way to introduce it to the public. And if you're wondering how the, how that came about, well, think of what's happened in the last 20 years. We've got high-speed internet, we've got social media, and we've got six billion smartphones. You want to put out the same message out to everybody, and you know full well. I mean, people are just walking around with their phones all day. You can get the sex, same message out to everybody within minutes, mm -hmm. and they would. You know, all you have to do is spin a story, and you could kind of turn it in your direction. And so now I'm kind of. I think that flat Earth is part of a bigger a bigger agenda where okay. I do believe that flat earth is real, but I think it is part of, um, it, it opens minds up to bigger possibilities because if you can get it, your head around flat earth, 
then you're going to be open to just about everything. And that's when you introduce something bigger. And yeah. at that point, where are we talking about celestial event? Are we talking about the introduction of an old, old civilization that you can play off as aliens or maybe not aliens? And you say, well, that's that's super, you know, I don't know, that's really fringy and way out there. I'm going, really? Because the United States, <laughs> the United States, I'm not picking, I don't vote. The United States is going to re-elect a reality television star as the president of the United States. Hey, don't 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 tell me that what's what's impossible. Don't tell me yeah. what's what's weird. Uh, there's a lot of really really super strange stuff that's happening out there that even I wouldn't have said was ten years ago would have been possible. And I, I think we're 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 at that that apex of you know where things get loudest just before the the big explosion. So that's why I think's coming. Yeah, really good points. Um, everything you just said there. From my like research recently, obviously, um, there's points you raised of why not to tell people um, kept coming up, uh, especially the, I guess, the breakdown of science and people kind of conforming back to religion, like, you know, how the world was once sort of run, like ran was um, a big fear. Um, and I'm just curious, what's your, uh, do you have much sort of religious belief or kind of where do you stand with that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, well, I grew up uh, in a in a very strong born again Christian household, you know, evangelical type thing, um, where church wasn't just a Sunday thing. It was, uh, you know, I had youth group and vacation Bible school and went to camp up in you know Christian camp up in uh, British Columbia, Canada, and. But then, uh, but, I, but, I, but I grew up on a rural island when this happened. And so when I left and went to university, uh, everything kind of changed for me. You know, my eyes were opened and, and then I got into conspiracies and then I got into tech. And if you get into tech, you know, if you're, if you're into that a lot, um, you know, that pulls you away from spirituality because you're, mm -hmm. you're more interested in, again, the science of, of things. I, yeah. I love the globe. I love the, the globe icons. I love physics. Um, I loved all the science-y, love science fiction. I mean, Star Wars, Stargate, um, uh, what was the other one? Star Wars, sorry. Star Trek. Jeez, I totally forgot about that. I mean, stuff like that. And, but then when I got into Flat Earth, um, all that changed. And because the default shape of the, of the Flat Earth means that it was built, it was constructed. And, you know, it's not, it's not this big bang, random accident thing. It was constructed by something, by some, yeah. by someone. And if that's the case, again, you know, take your pick. It's, you, it's either the divine or some older civilization that's much mm -hmm. more powerful than our own. At that point, you know, one man's advanced civilization is another man's deity. And so, and I saw this again and again and again with people that were getting into flat earth or they were. Um, I mean, like, for example, in the United States, at least half of the members are really strong Christians and yeah. because if they were it, because and they and I really didn't really go into this much in the in the in the series. But people were pointing out they were start going through the Bible. It's like, what does this mean? What does flat earth mean? It's like the curse now of all pastors that are out there because congregations are coming up to them saying, what does flat earth mean to to the in the Bible? And. There was this uh, great guy named Rob Skiba who made a website called testingtheglobe.com where he, he went through with a, with a fine-tooth comb uh, chapter and verse. And he goes, except for one verse, it's basically a flat earth book. You know, and, and I don't go into too many chapters and ver chapter and verses, but there are some an amazing stories along those lines. Um, the most notable, which I covered in the, uh, the clues, was the Tower of Babel which is that's genesis where okay if you're on a ball you know if it's a bridge to heaven it's building that's literally going to reach heaven connect you know to 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 the outside this world then the can't the world can't be moving because otherwise it's going to be a, it's basically a needle on an orange that's just spinning you know uh, the earth's spinning a thousand miles an hour and it's going around the earth the solar you know the sun at sixty thousand miles an hour and it's spinning sideways through the galaxy at half a million miles an hour well, that that means the Tower of Babel is never in the same place at, at, at any given time, so it, it's worthless. But if it's a snow globe, then that tower is going exactly one place. And that really resonated with some people, even though I never even used the chapter or verse or even said the Tower of Babel at any time during the clues. People got it. 
and yeah. the Christian community just latched onto it, and every other story they they grabbed uh, po- pointed in the same direction, with the exception of one. And that was one verse, which was um, Isaiah forty twenty two. He who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Well, again, you know, the ancient Hebrew, you know, and its circle is different. Circle is not ball. It's not globe. It's not sphere. It's circle. Your dinner, dinner plate, your dining room table, your hubcap, they're all circular. So at best, it's it's a gray area. And yet there are pastors that are literally hanging on by their fingernails to that verse. Because they don't want to go to their congregation and say, oh, yeah, by the way, I know that we used to think the earth was flat and we renounced it just so science could do its thing. But now it's flat again. They don't they don't want to they don't want to say it. So, yeah, for spirituality for me, I've got it. But I've got a deeper understanding for it now. I've got much more respect for like, yeah, I was raised born again Christian. But I am not going to denounce or even dismiss the other four major religious houses, which are um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. Because, I, you know, one, they all have at least a billion followers, and they're all as dedicated as Christians. So I think they all have pieces of the same puzzle, and I think that's part of the mystery, yep. that it's all been scattered. You know, the puzzle was broken and scattered, uh, you know, to all these different places and people. And I think in the end... They're all going to have to come together before it's over. Yeah, definitely. I think the way, Mark, you just broke it all kind of down um, is going to resonate with people, uh, at least who have listened to me a few times, like for a fair bit, I suppose, um, some of the episodes, like the whole idea that the Earth is constructed for a sole purpose by someone or some sort of civilization, right? Right. Uh, I've definitely spoken about that. Like, I wasn't raised religious per se, but... Um, my my mum's quite spiritual, and I went to a um, Church of England uh, high school and things like that. So religion was it was a part of like the daily sort of thing, but it was just kind of going on in the background, I suppose. Um, and then obviously when I got more and more into the um, extraterrestrial kind of stuff, that really resonated with me in the sense of why like a god doesn't have to be this like angelic type being where you know. It's one person, be all, end all. Um, the whole concept of, I suppose, another civilization, much older than our, like us, uh, could have actually, you know, they, they are the creator in a sense. Sure. And I've spoken to um, a few different people on the podcast who have that same sort of idea. So the fact that you sort of have summarized it in a sense of that's kind of how you are seeing it. And that is kind of, it's just funny because like I would never have even thought Flood Earth could come into that. But the fact that that's kind of like what you see the bigger picture as, and that's very on the same sort of plane of like where I am right now, that's that's kind of like just spun me out a little bit, I suppose. Because, right. you know, I don't know, it's, I just never saw those two sort of interconnecting. And now that's sort of just given me like a lot to think about, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's a weird journey. Um, everyone, the, the flat earth concept starts out as such a simple thing. Um, I kind of, um, liken it to uh, a child's puzzle box you know something simple you see on a um a park bench and you watch somebody you know from the outside pick it up and and they're having trouble with it and you think this guy's a moron it's a child's puzzle he should be able to solve it in two seconds he puts it down and you pick it up and the longer you play with it the more you look at it you realize it's much more complex and it has way more ramifications than than you ever thought it just starts out as a simple thing you know it's like oh it's flat earth right it's the world's flat and then but the the connotations behind it are i mean they shake the very foundations of science and turn people i mean i've i've seen there uh, let me put it this way in the christian community I, I we have there's actually dedicated flat out of the not our normal flat earth conferences they're dedicated christian flat earth conferences which is amazing and i've i've watched the tapes where they're saying because i haven't gone to a lot of them i'm going to my first one this year where they said we have never seen a recruiting tool for religion as as strong as this ever where people they're just all these people it's like oh yeah you know they hadn't been to church in 10 years or longer and all of a sudden they're 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 going back now i haven't gone back to church in a long time still but that's because you know for me this is you know i'm what i try to tell people is like i'm the freshman recruiter for this thing I can't, I can't just focus in on one particular group or demographic. I'm, I'm the one that gets you into Flat Earth University. I'm, 
I'm the I'm the guy that says, yeah, all these campus buildings behind me, go for it. You know, it's it's the other people's job to to get them into the into the classrooms. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a weird weird journey. That's again, uh, be, before before I go, I mean, I I got to get the statement out here, which is like, look, anyone's listening to this because I know there's people just bracing against it. It's like, look, I'm not here to convince you. I'm not even here to persuade you. All I'm doing is throwing the idea out at you and say, look, yeah. you know, don't don't take my word for it. I'm probably some complete lunatic. Uh, you know, do your own research, ask questions and figure it out for yourself and then, you know, resolve it one way or the other. Because once it's in your head, unfortunately, and I'm sorry, it, you can't remove it. It's there, period. Yeah. You're going to be thinking about it and there's nothing you can do to stop it. It's like a marble in a paint can. Um, you can you can ignore it eventually if if you really but then you're just kind of in this permanent stage of denial where it's like either you, you believe it or you don't I mean if you've got a master's degree in any sort of physical science for example nothing I can do for you you're you're going to I mean, that it's just gonna that's gonna come through you know mainstream media and eventually but everybody else you know is, uh, the the procedure usually takes or say the journey takes usually about two weeks once you really start if you try to disprove it the t-shirt reads i became a flat earther because i tried to debunk it and that's what everybody does <laughs> it's like oh yeah flat earth piece of trash i can have or i'm sorry rubbish totally just shut it down and yeah and then you keep watching <laughs> so sorry let, let me end this part with um the the chap the first chapter of my uh the book i'm i'm coming out with is called look away it's like, and it's the the line. It's kind of a modified line of Men in Black. It's like, look, if if you like your life, you wake up and everything is awesome. If you think you've got a good bead on things, don't do it. Don't look at it because if you do, it's gonna consume you. And then you know, at the end, I mean, you're not gonna hate me. You know, like Rob Skiba, he's got a slide in his presentation which says um, April April fifteenth, twenty fifteen, the day Mark Sargent ruined my life. Uh, you know, it's not true. I, I'm not ruining anybody's life. I'm, I'm, I'm warning you, though. If you, <laughs> if you just want to do your thing, go ahead and do it. You go down this road, it's like, oh no, flat Earth. I could totally shut it down. It's like, no, nope, yeah, don't, don't do it. But anyway, just as I just said, like, it's so fascinating. I think just because there's so much that, as you said, that goes on in the background, and it, it just sparks so many other ideas, and how so much of it's kind of connected to. I don't know, I guess a lot of other topics um, I've spoken about on this podcast. So it's just, it's put it in a very different oh, um, oh yeah, you, life. Oh, yeah, you'll have you to know? revisit every, if you get into Flat Earth, you have to revisit every conspiracy you ever did. Um, yeah. There's only one, here's the good news for, for conspiracy people out there. Uh, the good news is, is just about every conspiracy dovetails into Flat Earth because Flat Earth is so physically huge that every conspiracy is under its umbrella. The bad news is there's only there is one conspiracy. If you remember a guy named uh, Richard Hoagland from from some years ago, he was the one of the cons early conspiracy guys that said that there's a secret space program, not just not just a normal space program, but a super secret, super advanced space program. There's like five million people living on the moon and hundreds of thousands of people living on Mars. And the and you know, and basically Earth has already started colonizing things. Well. That's one of the only ones that can't dovetail into Flat Earth because you can't actually colonize the moon or Mars or anything. They're just pretty lights in the sky. And in fact, I was supposed to debate him uh, a couple of years ago and he, he, he bailed. He wasn't going to do it um, because I think he realized that Flat Earth just flew in the face of it. And they, they were just, he wasn't going to be, he wasn't going to be able to go anywhere with it. But yeah, you'll have to revisit everything. Uh, oh, especially, yeah. especially and, and by the way, aliens absolutely would dovetail into Flat Earth. But they wouldn't be from Mars and Jupiter and Venus. No, of course not. They would just be... Yeah, that makes perfect sense. They would just be older versions of ourselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're into that stuff, uh, you know full well that there's older versions of our civilization that have been kind of swept under the rug. You know, the sunken cities mm -hmm. off of Japan, sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, Bimini Road, the real pyramids, and so on and so on. Those... Um, the you know i i believe that that older civilizations we're not the first civilization to rent this apartment by a long shot and i think it's kind of like the prime directive i think that every civilization has their time frame and then they are moved off kind of like a graduating class and you know it's like well you can't 
<laughs> you don't have to go home, but you have to get the hell out of here. And they're, yeah. they're moved off to somewhere, and they're not allowed to interact directly with the with the with the current population, Prime Directive style. And if you think I'm kidding, look up something. I don't know if you've ever covered it on on your show. Um, look up something called the 1561 Nuremberg event, which is fascinating. It is people. It's like when you ask somebody, "What's the greatest UFO sighting of all time?" Of course, the average person will say, "Oh, it's Roswell. It's Roswell." No, it's not <laughs> Roswell. It's the 1561 Nuremberg event, um, where uh, uh, two giant space armadas <laughs> just started duking it out over one of the biggest cities in Europe at the time, Nuremberg, for a full hour on a beautiful sunny morning in April. And and after after a long time, I and mean, they had sketch artists. Remember, there was no photography back then. They had sketch artists drew the whole th damn thing out. And these two factions battled for a whole hour, and then a third faction showed up, a giant single black angular craft pulled up right between them. The other two scatter. And they even talked about an ancient aliens briefly, although they left out the third faction, which I thought was interesting, because it raises huge amounts of questions, which is, okay, first off, why were the two there in the first place? Who were they? Why they hate each other? Um, who was the third group? Were they the cops? Were they the UN? Obviously, the two groups couldn't take on this third group, so they had to leave. Um, and the, my bigger question is, why did it take what, what, you know, response time? It took the other group a full hour to show up. Do they find some sort of dead zone, some sort of radar zone? Were they not, you know, it was, it was amazing. Um, and but the point was that all three of these factions have not dealt with us directly. You know, they, they, uh, I don't think you like anything like with Star Trek. You're not supposed to land in Main Street anywhere, mm -hmm. come out, take a few selfies, sign a few autographs and, and leave because it would have way too much of an impact on the population. And I think those ships that are flying around, all those those ancient civilizations, uh, I think there's remnants of them still around. And yeah. they're just kind of, it's part of the system. I think one day we will be those guys where, mm. you know, they'll be survivors of our civilization. I don't know how many, because uh, yeah. Lord knows the, uh, uh, sorry, let me, let me, um, I got to throw this in there because people say, well, you know, we're not that bad. You know, are we, I've, I've said, are we a, um, uh, a box full of kittens that's meant to be protected from the outside world? Or are we a box full of, full of scorpions that never ever should be let out under any circumstances? And you think, well, that might be extreme. I go, no, look at, we're, we're critical for ourselves. Look at the original movie, um, The Day the Earth Stood Still from, yeah. from the 50s. I mean, the premise of that was is that a, a civilization came down, saw us and said, oh yeah, by the way, don't you even think about colonizing anything <laughs> because... You're horrible. I mean, it's true. I mean, we, we're barbarians by, by comparison to just about every science fiction thing we ever write. We're, we're always the bad guys. We we, in fact, have we ever written a science fiction story where we're the elegant ones? <laughs> it's always somebody else. It's like, you know, they're more calm, more rational. We just seem to set fire to everything. Ah, anyway. That's a good point. Yeah. You're definitely right there. Anyway, um, what else you got? No, this is like some really fascinating stuff there, I must say. Um, so just going back to, um, I just want to understand who do you think knows about uh, the full kind of, well, at least most of the story, right? So you're kind of saying NASA's in on it. Um, what governments know about the Earth being flat and that was sort of in this? Well, uh, at the highest levels, here's the thing. Um, this is a need to know deal. This <laughs> isn't like the Manhattan Project where you hire hundreds of thousands of people to refine uranium for the atomic bomb. And they all know something, but they don't, they, you know, nobody knows everything. At the highest levels, I would think, yeah, maybe a few thousand people know, as far as the, the full story of it, you know, because you're gonna have to have, but, but you don't need to tell people that much. Like for example, like keeping, keeping the Antarctic Treaty intact and making sure that like British Petroleum doesn't make a big fuss about not being able to go to Antarctica, right? All you have to do is tell the exec, you have a military guy from, I don't know, MI6 or whatever British intelligence, you go to them and say, look, it's national security. Don't think about doing anything in Antarctica uh, and make sure you tell whoever your predecessor is, you know, whoever gets hired after you. And if you don't, we're going to tell them one way. All, we, all we're saying is don't, you know, it's we're keep it quiet. All you have to do is say national security. So... 
the space agencies at the highest levels, yes. Some, a few people here and there, the telemetry guys. In fact, you probably want to hire the same telemetry guys to do certain projects. Governments, like, does the president of the United States know? I think he knows something, but until you are officially briefed, what do you really know? So he may suspect things, but until you get a military briefing saying exactly how it's laid out, you don't have to, you don't have to know anything. So, and honestly, the president of the United States and most leaders are uh, public leaders. They're just puppets anyway. You know, it's the, it's the people with the, the bank accounts that have so many digits, it doesn't matter. The people that could sink economies, those guys probably know. Um, but very, very few people, very, very few people like the military people that, that protect certain zones. Again, they suspect things, but it's no different than what, what military does now. Remember the spy reference I gave you earlier, which was you're paid to do a certain job. And there's an old, there's so many, how many sayings? We'll use the, uh, one of the oldest, which is it's above your pay grade. You can't, you're not allowed to, it's above your security clearance to ask certain questions. So needs, need to know basis. Does the, you know, the average fighter pilot that's guarding something need to know? Nope. Does the president of the United States need to know? Nope. Does Neil deGrasse Tyson need to know? Nope. Why would you? You want these guys acting naturally. They've seen what happens when people find out. And by that, look at the Apollo astronauts after they got back from the moon during the international press conference. These guys look like, like a family member had died. I'd never seen yeah. a group look so guilty in all my life. <laughs> and they're sitting in front of the international <laughs> press. It's like, why? And that's because they told them. Why wouldn't they? It's like, all right, let's try this out. Let's see what happens. And it's, it's too big for the average person to keep a secret. And like, you know, it, and of course you feel guilty, you know, when you have parades and schools, you know, that are named after you. So anyway, yeah, very few people by comparison, thousands, thousands at most, at most, the rest of the people just, they know something, but they don't know the whole story. Yeah. So interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I, if you would have gone to me five years ago and said, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, this is what you're going to be doing. You're, you're, <laughs> you're going to be doing this full time and traveling around to different countries and, and speaking and writing and making videos on it. I would have looked at you and I would have said, get the hell out of here. There's, there's, no, there's no way. There's no way in a million years. And that's whatever. That's, again, shows you kind of the power of the topic. Because everybody starts out that way. Everybody says, oh, well, Flat Earth is the stupidest thing ever. And then all of a sudden I hear from them a month later. And they say, uh, yeah, you know what? <laughs> it's, it's not the craziest thing ever. And I go, I know, right? It can't, and, and all I did, all I did was I made the dummies guide for it. I didn't invent Flat Earth. I didn't invent even Flat Earth 2.0. Uh, all I did was I created the, um, the, the, the dummies guide, the 101 book which nobody had done nobody had, had boiled it down for the layman and yep. that again call it luck call it fate call it synchronicity uh, that was part of my training that's what i did was i boiled things down for people and so i just made this this series of ideas which lose like no math <laughs> and just really just put it out there I, I honestly i didn't even know the curvature of the earth when i made them i didn't know yeah. i just said look everything i look at points at this in the same direction which is the world is not what you think it is. It's there's something more, there's something happening here at the very most basic level. It's flat. And that's where you start. And then after that, you know, you're just kind of wandering around a new world trying to figure out <laughs> what it all, not only what exactly the shape is, but what it means. And that's where we are now. That's where I am. That's what I do every day. It's like, uh, you know, not only do I try to shut down flat earth every day, which I can't do. It's, it's a silly attempt. Uh, but I also try to figure out what it means and still to this day, even now, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which is great. And it's, I don't know, it's just so interesting. I think, um, from my perspective of just hearing like it, I just didn't realize, I suppose how I knew there was obviously going to be other sort of layers to it, but, um, just hearing yourself sort of talk about it, like it's always, it's kind of like a, a running thing. Um, like I spoke to a exorcist. Uh, a couple of weeks back yeah. and literally, you know, talking about obviously religion and how exorcisms have kind of come into that. But next minute we're talking about aliens and how that's all kind of connected. So it always, it's, it's like, as soon as you start to look at these sort of, um, I don't know, like almost paranormal, supernatural, what pseudoscience kind of topics, it's bizarre how everything does sort of intertwine. And 
I honestly I just didn't think flat earth could come to that. But now like look at me, you know, we've been talking for like an hour and a half now. I'm just going, wow, that really, Oh yeah. it's, it's something, you know, something there, I think. Yeah. There's an old saying that I love so much, which is, um, things are never, uh, well, rarely things are rarely ever what they first appear to be. And, you know, mm. we all have our certain impressions, you know, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. But when you start looking into a topic as, as big as this and, and other stuff, there seems to be a lot of in, interconnectivity and uh, you run into the same stuff over and over and things that are being used for multiple purposes. And uh, yeah, there's there's uh, what's the line from um, JFK The you know, there's definitely, you know, there's a lot of smoke, but there also is some fire here. There's something, there's something else to it. So yeah, I encourage people like, look, well, first off, yeah. Again, if you enjoy your life, don't do it. Don't look at it. Don't, don't do <laughs> it. which is revert a little bit of a reverse psychology. Cause I know they will. Yeah. Uh, but the other part is if you do look into it, just, you know, take it slow. I, I kind of, let, let me end it on this, which is, I kind of treat it like I, it's one of my running jokes, which is the flat earth drug deal, which if you can imagine a guy standing on a street corner with a trench coat with a whole bunch of drugs and all these drugs are conspiracies, right? All these, all the conspiracies you've ever heard of. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, I got this one drug for you, man. But I don't know if I should give it to you because, you know, maybe too much. It's like, if you take it, you know, it's like, and of course the person's like, oh no, I totally want this drug. And it's like, no, no, my, well, if you do it, don't, don't take too much, man. Don't, and you didn't get it from me. And that's what it's like where, you know, it's yeah. this weird new drug that once you're, you know, if you, if you take too much too quickly, you're gonna, you're gonna freak out a bit. You're gonna sit, you're gonna, you're not gonna sleep. <laughs> you're gonna stay up and people i've i've had too much where people like watching videos and watching videos and they fall asleep and they get up and they watch more videos and not my stuff you know you know there's so much content out there um yeah uh Definitely. there's if you if you want to look at it there's just a ton of content now uh and in fact mainstream i mean just about every large channel and mainstream <clears throat> channel has now covered it so you know you'll find the good stuff the good stuff's out there so you'll yeah not not hard to find it's that same thing as you said there. Like, if you enjoy your life, don't don't look into yeah, the don't do it. sort of stuff. Don't do it. Like, like, well, it, ignorance is bliss. It always has been. Exactly right. Yeah. So it's just it blows me away when people can't. I don't know. They just kind of live their everyday lives and they don't think about you know these bigger sort of picture things. Right. And it's always bothered me. Like, as soon as you know, you start to like look into like people's um, opinions in the afterlife. You know, people have claimed to have died and they've gone and seen something that have been resuscitated. Right. And I'm like, I would just sit on that and dwell on that for hours. You know what I mean? It's like, and people just say to me, why don't you just enjoy living in the, the now while you're actually alive and worry about that when it kind of comes. And it's like, but how can you not even think about that while you're sitting at work? Or, you know, just, yeah, it's just so it, interesting, isn't it, it? Well, most of the time, yeah, ignorance is bliss, but if they get a glimmer of the truth, in fact, there's this great line from uh, JFK, if anyone hasn't watched it from the early 90s, I would I would highly recommend it just to watch the, the Donald Sutherland monologue towards the end of the movie where he said that deep down people are suckers for the truth. They uh, people love getting because we're, we're big gossip hounds anyway. You know, we love telling stories to each other. And, and this this is why sorry, I got to get this one more thing out Which flat earth has kind of leaped beyond the Internet to it's become a campfire story. Which is yeah. when you're talking to somebody on the street, um, usually, you know, you know so let's talk about the weather and, and, and then you talk about sports teams and usually end with somebody, you know, exchanging interesting stories. It's like, oh, I heard that you eat three ounces of chocolate, a di you know, a week, you know, you could reduce your chances of liver cancer, something like that. Right. And then Flat Earth now has become part of that conversation where it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I got one for you. <laughs> I heard, I saw a thing on YouTube the other day, there's people that believe the earth is flat, you know, and then you bring up some little factoid about it. And they, I mean, that is what happens. I've seen it now time and time again. It does not, flat earth is spreading outside of the internet. And so it's a weird little, because again, the concept is easy, kind of like the English language. What they say is uh, English is easy to learn, really difficult to master. And because we, we break our own rules with the English language and same thing with flat earth. And that is easy to learn, but man, there's a lot. Of, I mean, you know, even after four years, I'm still picking up new stuff every week. So anyway. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, uh, just from like a personal level, how I'm assuming, of course, it's gotten easier over the years, but how have you dealt with being so interested in this topic and feeling like you can't really, you know, tell 
the, you know, everyone, like people you work with at the time or whoever, because I, I, I've looked at a bunch of your videos and obviously a lot of the comments are quite negative or they're, oh, yeah. they're just, you know, trolls. They're like how, how do you sort of block that out or how do you go about just focusing on? Well, yeah. two, okay, two, two things. One is when it comes to trolls, you got to remember, I mean, I'm older, so I remember when the trolls were born back when the first forums came out and, and people realized they could log in anonymously and just say anything they want. You know, troubled childhoods, you know, people that have, you know, experienced a whole bunch of, the pain, of pain in their lives and they just want to lash out. I mean, honest to God, it doesn't matter what kind of video you make. People say, well, you know, I'm only going to make safe videos that, that is content is really, really um, not offensive to anybody. I go, it wouldn't matter. I go, you could make a, a video about a kitten chasing a puppy you know, across a, a, a field with a butterfly chasing them. And it's the cutest thing ever, right? And within, I think, 100 views, you're going to get somebody that's going to say, this is effing gay, thumbs down, unsubbed, right? Yeah. <laughs> Literally that fast. because And they take pride in it. It's rare that you can actually see any video that'll go 100 to nothing. You know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Because they'll people literally pride themselves. Like, I'm going to be the first thumbs down. <clears throat> So you gotta get, you gotta understand that that mentality. But the other thing for me is I can't get mad at anybody that attacks, because because it'd be hypocritical. That's that's the big yeah. thing here. Which is look, I used to be them, and and so people. I, seriously, I had a guy. In fact, he was in your neck of the woods. He was a New Zealand. Um, I know you guys are different, because uh, I was just at a conference in New Zealand. His name was Guy Williams, I believe, comedian slash, um, just internet irritant. And he was coming at me as hard as he could during like a 40 minute interview. And he was asking us, like, why aren't you getting mad? He goes, I'm swearing at you. I'm pushing all these buttons. I'm going, cause I was you. How, how can I get mad at you? If I lashed out, it's like, why, how dare you, sir? We should have dueling pistols at dawn. You know, if I do that, that's, that's how I started. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was in that, that, that mindset. Whereas flat earth is stupid. It is ridiculous. It's stupid. It's stupid. It's stupid until one day it's not. That's in fact, I have watched. Here's will give you a good idea. So, like, I will have. I had people that get in that like will make flat Earth against flat Earth videos, right? I've seen them. It's like you know, like third flat Earth video, you know, anti flat Earth, anti flat Earth, fifth video, anti flat Earth. I hate it. It's stupid. It's dumb. And like the sixth one, they're like, yeah, you know what? It's not really that dumb. I'm into flat Earth now. It's like, and they leave the other five up. You know, it's like they forgot the journey. They forgot, <laughs> they forgot what they were like. It's like, you're going to pull those down? Because you actually called me an idiot in three of them. And they're, and they're like, what? Oh, it's fine. It's like, what? Um, so, no, when it comes to people that attack, uh, I well, well and, and let's be fair here. Um, I do not read most of the YouTube comments for partic That's particularly fair. that reason. <laughs> because I want people to say, do you read the comments? I go, no, I want to sleep at night. Because it's yeah, it's still it, it still gets at you. I mean, you can read we 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 focus on the negative. I mean, you can read fifteen mm -hmm. comments in a row. You're great. You're wonderful. Thank you. Inspiring. So great. And then you get one. It's like you are a terrible person. You should die and, or never reproduce and be cut up in itty bitty pieces and buried alive. It's like what? And then you just focus on that. So no, 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 no. I I just don't. I just which is bad because I don't read. I don't see most of the good comments too. Uh, but I know there's no the internet. Uh, the T-shirt should read. Um, uh, I used to okay. The, what was the saying I came up with? It was like I used to think that um, if you can't say something nice, uh, you, you know, don't say anything at all. You know, you've heard that one. Well, no. Now, now I have one different. It's like if you can't say something nice, you're probably in the YouTube forums <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> it's true. It's just a den of freaking vip yeah. vipers in there. And that's mostly because it's anonymous and that is trolls. But that being said, here's the good news is that 99% of my emails are absolutely wonderful, positive or neutral at the worst. Very few mm -hmm. trolls because, you know, trolls want to be anonymous. That's the whole point of being a troll. You're the voice in the mob that, that yells out. That's like, who said that? And, you know, and the person never pipes up because they're cowards. Um, nobody, they, and trolls are also lazy. So they don't spoof emails. To, to troll me they don't leave i mean i, I got a troll I actually eat uh, voicemail this morning it's usually drunk guys very rarely will they do it sober you know they'll you'll get it like two or three guys like oh call him call him you can hear him giggling in the background i get that yeah, right. well. but never sober you know i rarely because then you have to spoof a phone number and all that so uh, but yeah that's how i deal with it i just either ignore it or i, I mean it's empathy it's like i understand them 
I get it. It's like, yeah, yeah fine. You're you're bent out of shape right now, but you you know you either come around or you won't, and uh, it's fine. I and truthfully, as long as they're talking about it, it's what producers told me um, some years ago. It doesn't matter whether you love it or hate it, as long as you're talking about it. And sure. that is true. I mean, the, the you make a flat Earth video. That's why I think so many of these channels got into it. The comment, the, your views may go up a little bit, but what happens is your comment section goes up exponentially. People just freaking Donny Brook it into the into the comment section. They just fight it out. I mean, it's extremely polarizing. Meaning, um, very few people have I run into where they're just on the fence about flat Earth. You know, it's like you either love it or you hate it. Very few people are in that zone where it's like, eh, I don't really care either way. No, it's it's really polarizing. And you got to ask yourself why. And that's, again, because of the conditioning. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Full on. Yeah. I must say, like, as I said at the start, I've only just kind of started really doing some research and kind of hearing um, where the whole sort of flat earth uh, sort of originated from and the reasoning for it and everything like that. But after hearing you speak about it, I think you put it, as you've kind of said, you put it in a simple format right. as well. So you can kind of break down the steps, right. but I think also just your, um, the whole idea about there's something more going on. It's not just we're being lied to and everything like that right. really does actually connect with me. And it, it's definitely how, how I thought about it earlier has definitely changed now. You know, obviously I'm not saying, uh, as you said, it takes quite a, quite a bit of time, a bit of reading, a bit of research oh, yeah. to convert yourself, but it's definitely opened my mind. Uh, and not that, and I'm never that sort of person, obviously, because I'm into everything paranormal, conspiracy. Um, so and the flat earth was never the thing for me. I was like, nah, they're just full of shit. Um, yeah. They're insane or whatever, you know. But I think now uh, it's definitely given it a little more foundation uh, for me to at least, you know, watch some more videos and, you know, ponder the idea because it's, it's, it's made, it hasn't made me interested. You know, I must say you have, uh, put it in such a way that, and, you know, I'm sure people listening to this, I'm sure a select few will be the same and other people will just, you know, might not even listen. I, I can honestly, I can see this kind of ruffling some feathers and that's kind of why I wanted to do it. Right. Because oh, yeah. it's, and it's just fun, right? Yeah. Like talking about flat Earth, like yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 po It's the only conspiracy which actually has a weird little positive spin to it, which is why there's a, yeah. way more women in it than I would have expected. Well, well one, women are, are more open minded, but it's got a positive. I mean, um, like for example, the music. People make songs about flat Earth. A lot of songs um, in just about every genre you can think of. I got a playlist on my channel called Flat Earth Music. Where every genre you can think of, you know, rock and pop and country and folk and techno and you just you name it, because it's got this, you know, it, it gives people purpose, for lack of a better term. They feel like it's oh hey, I'm not alone. And now they don't know exactly who who's in the room with them, but they're they know they're not alone. And you know that that hey, maybe this world was meant, you know, for for me. I'm not this this stupid little tiny rock flying through an impossible universe that could get snuffed out at any time and it, it inspires people it's it's amazing it's like oh wow and so yeah there's there's some weird little connotations to it to where i, I if when whenever we talk next the the media is already trying to kind of paint me into like a cult leader and i'm going well i don't know if i go that far i mean yeah. we don't have robes or a bible or a compound or you know we're not chanting yet so i you know i don't think that's we're, we're quite there but it's mostly science they're just scared because they're saying you know what what happens to science it's like well you're going to have to take a couple steps back if this actually happens because mm -hmm. this was your fault to begin with so you know, we'll have to see where where it goes definitely yeah. where can um if people who are interested in your work yeah. mark uh, what's the best way for them to come across that uh easiest way is just to google flat earth clues that was the main series that's out there um that, that that'll that'll get you to most of the stuff the the big documentary that was made uh was called behind the curve which is on everything you can find it on everything from netflix to itunes to Amazon and stuff like that. Uh, my book is called Flat Earth Clues. Uh, the second book is also going to be called Flat Earth Clues. First one was called The Sky's the Limit. The second one, which will be coming out in a couple months, is called um, End of the World. 
uh, which is kind of a dig on science because they keep calling it saying it's going to be the end of the world. And uh, the YouTube channel is just my name, Mark Sargent. You can just type in Mark Sargent into YouTube. You'll find me. So, and I'm sorry, it's spelled S-A-R-G-E-N-T. It's not the military spelling. It's phonetic. So, but yeah, e easy to find. Uh, just, you know, and there's so many content people out there that are making stuff. So don't be shy about clicking on on other people that, that make content. There's just a slew of them. I mean, I mean now there's... I mean, there's thousands and thousands of hours of content out there. So, you know, poke around, see what, what resonates with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me throw one more in there, which is um, for new people just getting into this. I made a playlist, especially for new people. It's called the Flat Earth Shortlist for New People. And it's a collection of the easiest to digest videos from different content makers. And I think there's only like 20, 25 videos in there. So check that out. Perfect. Yeah. Um, just for my own curiosity too, are you doing um, many interviews at the moment? Like what sort of, um, like obviously the topic's really hot at the moment, so you're getting on many sort of like radio shows, podcasts, yeah. sort of. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did, um, oh, it's, it's hard to keep track now. I, I literally don't know how many interviews I've done. It's in the hundreds. Um, yeah, wow. But I did, when I went down to the, um, the Auckland conference, mm -hmm. I did the which was weird because i did the today show in your in fact how did you find out about me did you see my interview on the today show in australia no so it's kind of funny um i work in radio right uh, here in australia so um i work I, i'm originally from brisbane oh and about a year ago i moved down to adelaide for this radio gig so i'm an audio producer for uh, a breakfast show here and i'm good friends with the guy in Brisbane who does the same job as me, but um, for the Brisbane show. And he knows about my whole podcast and everything like that. And he was like, yeah, we had a, we had this guy on um, who they got on and, you know, it was like a change my mind kind of segment. Oh yeah. I remember the change my mind segment. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and he sent me that and I was like, wow, this dude's like really put together. Uh, and I loved that. Like you just had, answers for everything and you know you were very level-headed i was like oh wow like that's a really good get so then uh, i started to like you know do a bit of research into you i was like oh wow this is like perfect and you know wanted to do the uh topic for a little while and then you know you're really easy to um get in contact with and you you know replied like within i don't know just a few hours oh, yeah, so i was like yeah, yeah. perfect you know so um that's actually yeah how i, um, I sort that, of you're, you're um, absolutely right for whatever reason when i was down in new zealand i got a whole bunch of australian radio things and then uh, the today show um was before that so i did the today show uh, australia just before i went down there and then on top of doing new zealand shows I was getting calls from Australia, and I think it was because of the Today Show was kind of bleeding over, and uh, like the yeah. your your friend, I think he watched some of the stuff from something else. Yeah, and I did the Change My Mind thing, where of course it was interesting, and what was interesting, what you didn't hear, was at the end. I wish I wish we recorded it. Unfortunately, I was doing it um, uh, from my, my hotel room down there in in New Zealand, which was the producer came on afterwards. She goes, yeah, she goes, just so you know, there were a whole bunch of people that called in that didn't want to change your mind that were absolutely pro flat earth. And I go, yeah. I go, but you didn't let them through. She goes, well, no, we weren't going to let them through that. The whole point of the show is to have them argue, argue yeah, with you. Right. Yeah. And she goes, so anyone that called in, she said, Oh, thanks for calling, but we can't, we can't let you on. Yeah. And, uh, and I've run into that before where, um, there was a, a physicist that I was debating down in Los Angeles at a, a on location at this one show. And, they were calling around all the universities trying to get a physicist and there was this asian professor out of usc who said oh flat earth i would love to talk about that is, is mark Sargent going to be there and he says yeah you're going to be debating mark Sargent." he goes oh no i don't want to debate i'm into flat earth <laughs> and they said sorry we, we can't we can't use you and it's like oh so yeah that's really cool yeah that again small world how things it is connect right. and uh uh, yeah, the change my mind segment was was kind of fun. I wish it would actually would have been longer, but I know they didn't have a lot. I know, of time. and that's a, that's a pain in the ass about radio. And like, because obviously working in it like every day, um, yeah. podcasting is just such a better platform because it's long form. You know, long form storytelling. People can really get their point across. And yeah. I know, unlike radio, where it's like three to five minutes. You know, really quick segments. Got to play the ads. Got to play the music. Got to play traffic. It's, it's such a yeah. shitty format really if like today where people want you know they want to binge listen to things and binge watch you know they want everything right now and yep 
Yep, yep. Yeah, well, so the attention it's... span is yeah, really, really short. Um, like the the documentary, for example. Now the documentaries have to be basically less than a hundred minutes, or you're gonna yeah. or you're gonna lose the audience. And uh, only the major Hollywood blockbusters can push two hours. And most of the time, you know, even then, you know, people are getting a little fidgety. So of course, yeah, yeah. And uh, and what what are the interviews are kind of doing? Uh, is it sort of this sort of format where just asking questions and you can just go for your life? Or how many? Or what's the, what's the percentage of then people trying to debate you? Or not as many, not as many there? as you might think, because they can't find anyone to debate. Um, yeah. That's the tough part. So most of the interviews are. I mean, yeah, you'll. you'll it really varies, you know. Radio shows can you know, segments from ten minutes to an hour or so, but depending on on what, like this is one of the longer ones. But the yeah. um, but most of the time you can't find anyone to. Um, most of the podcasts they'll have their own questions, and you can feel them people pretty quickly whether they're pro or con, or they'll announce it. It's like, oh, I'm not really into it, but I got questions. Um, yeah. as far as bringing in hardcore debaters, it's really really tough because. Science is really specialized. So, and there's only mm -hmm. ten thousand astrophysicists in the whole world. Wow! So, yeah, there there's go. not a lot of them. So, if you don't have those, you can maybe pick up an amateur astronomer. Um, there was a show in Australia. I did. I think it was Australia. Yeah, it was Australia. Um, where they brought in a NASA guy, not a not an astronaut, but a NASA scientist who worked uh, at at part of the Antarctic Research Program, which was interesting. Um, but it's rare. Super rare. Um, Neil Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't do debates. Uh, Bill Nye doesn't do debates. Michio Kaku doesn't do debates. Mm -hmm. um, and then Brian Cox doesn't do debates. I mean, those are the four. And, and remember, Bill Nye is not a scientist. But the other three guys, um, they're the most high profile. There's only three high profile scientists in the world. So it it makes things pretty difficult. So that that out of all the things, that's the most like there's interviews that that do not happen. Because they, they call me up, the producers call me up, and they say, oh, yeah, we'd love to do a debate with blah, blah, blah. And I say, great. And I warn them. I go, just so you know, don't get discouraged if you can't find an opponent. Because, you, you know, the scientists are like, nope, not going to do it. The other part is um, is that scientists are usually dry. You know, the, yeah. they do not have a lot of social skills, uh, articulation. <laughs> not really a thing with them. <laughs> and sure, so, yeah. which is why Bill Nye keeps getting gigs. It's, and that was that frustrates me. I've, I've dedicated videos against Bill Nye where, because that's media being lazy, which is like, OK, Bill Nye did a children's science education program, which was based off a comedy skit in Seattle. I know I grew up in the area and Disney picked it up for a few years and he wore a lab coat. And been, when those, these guys got older, it's like, OK, the, the media was tired of dragging somebody in from a university where they gave them monosyllable answers. It's like, yes, that is correct. You know, and they're super, you know, on camera, super dry. You know, it's like, oh my God. It's like pulling teeth trying to get anything out of them. And they realized Bill Nye <clears throat> set, was good on camera. He looks like a nerd. He sounds like a nerd. He can get his point across. And he's got, you know, enough stage time that he can do this. Well, that's good and bad because then they start dragging him in for everything, which is like, oh yeah, Bill Nye, what's your opinion on climate change? It's like, well, yeah. why are you asking him about climate change? He he doesn't know anything about climate change. Yeah, you know, what's your what's your <laughs> opinion? Well, I, wait, well, I'll put you on a quantum physics round table. It's like, what are you talking about? He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. That's all he did. And then he went into <laughs> acting. Um, and it's like, oh, you know, he was seriously he he was on part of the design council for the Mars rover. It wow. never ends. He goes to the White House and <laughs> because media, there's a lot of people that remember because. He lucked out. He was in the right place at the right time, and he did a program yeah. that ran, what, five or six years and was syndicated by Disney. Well, at that point, it might as well be Sesame Street or The Electric Company or any of those early children's programs. I mean, there's a lot of people that grew up with Bill Nye. So he's now officially a scientist. It's like, no. And even though on his wiki page it says he's a science educator, and you know, he's clear about saying that, no, because the science community would just annihilate him if he actually came out. It's like, yeah, I'm a scientist. No, he's not. So, I don't know. How did I even get off on that? <laughs> sorry, Bill <laughs> Nye just drives me insane. No, nah, it sounds like Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So, yeah, that's that's why we have a hard time getting people to debate us because the it's it's so thin on the ground to find, find mm -hmm. opponents that they're using Bill Nye in interviews on a regular basis uh, yeah, and right. that, because there's nobody else to get. 
So yeah, try try to find a debate opponent. I to where I've said, look, I'll I'll sit in a room with a panel of six against one. At this point, it's like bring anything, any odds to make you feel more comfortable. Whatever it takes, I will do it. To where even I put my the challenge. I said uh, because I'm so enthusiastic about the um, spacesuit issue. I said put I go give me a spacesuit, give me a freaking self-contained spacesuit, nothing tethered. Put me in a vacuum chamber, pull the switch. Of course, I want a scientist in there in another spacesuit, you know, just so I just don't die, you know, yeah. on my own. But but that's the point. I was like, look, I'm willing to even do that. I'm not even willing to, you yeah. know, I don't even care about money. Just put me in a freaking vacuum chamber. And they, um, no one, you know, no one calls. It's, I'm still, still waiting. Eh, anyway. Yeah, uh, I, do we, do we have any other time left? Because I, unfortunately, I do have to run. No, no, that's perfect. You've uh, you given me plenty of your time, which oh, cool. is uh, greatly appreciated. So yeah. thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if um, it, it, I'll let you know. By the way, I mean, I, I don't know how close you are to uh, to Sydney, but I'm seriously, I may be leaving in eight days to go down there to shoot a um, uh, shoot a promo for a company down there. Believe it or not, in, an endorsement. Go figure. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Good news, huh? Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll let you know if I'm I'm going to be in the area. Okay. No problem. Well, thank you so much once again for coming on the podcast okay. and I'll uh, talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Bye.